bit about the university. And um, if you have any questions, um, any concerns, please let me know and I'll be very happy to respond. Um, so as most of you know, the Catholic University in Erbil is a nonprofit institute of um, higher education and scientific research uh, that uh, provides uh, recognized degrees in, uh, in arts and sciences. And I don't know how much you know about the situation um, in Iraq in terms of government. So it, the Catholic University in Erbil is in the Kurdistan region and um, it's an autonomous region. It has its own government, its own parliament, which are different from the government of, um, of Baghdad, of the rest of Iraq. Um, so um, our degrees are actually recognized in both of these governments, the ministries of higher education of both. Um, so that's something really good that we very, feel very proud of. And um, also we were founded in December of 2015 by His Grace Archbishop Bashar uh, Matewerda, and I believe that everybody knows by now. Uh, he's the Archbishop of the Chaldean Catholic uh, Archdiocese of Erbil in Ankawa. And um, Ankawa is actually a predominantly Christian suburb of uh, Erbil. Um, and the university's foundation stone were laid actually in 2012 uh, with the help of Italian Bishops Conference. And um, it's also worth to mention that uh, CUE is the first university in the Middle East and North Africa uh, region to hold the name Catholic as an institution uh, where Catholic minority is actually, uh, Catholic community is actually a minority. Um, the mission and vision of the, of the university are to make learners of today leaders of tomorrow. Um, it's a community-based open academic institution uh, where higher education tradition is maintained. And it's also dedicated to forming the next generation of leaders who are equipped with the required training, skills, and competence needed in order to have a brighter future. Um, and also help their community at large. Um, and it's in a way is to serve uh, maintaining their dignity because um, the IDPs, I mean, and the, the mi minority population in general, because as you know, like they've been through a lot, uh, they've been seen, seen the world the worst. So um, having an opportunity to pursue their studies is, um, is something that the university is working uh, in order to maintain. And um, also, as I mentioned, uh, that the university is, um, is where minorities can study and learn in an environment which is safe for them, uh, in an environment where they are respected, no matter their faith, their culture, their background. And it's prov it also provides opportunities uh, for minority women to be empowered and to study in a place of uh, respect and uh, security. For these young people, uh, education is their hope for a future uh, that will allow them to stay in, in Iraq um, as they will be well qualified. And that's why CUE provides uh, one of the leading hopes to keep Christianity and other um, religions, uh, religious minorities in, in the region. We welcome students, as I mentioned, from different cultures, uh, different ethnicities, and different backgrounds to join our program where they can peacefully coexist um, and they can, the, where academic excellence is preserved. A place where, um, as I mentioned, quality, dignity, um, and justice is promoted. Uh, it's something that um, it's not something that only us that we speak about as a university, but also the students who study at the or university, they actually see this. Um, and it's also, I don't know if some of you know or, uh, or not the reason why the Catholic University in Erbil was founded. Um, 2014, uh, it was when 
Iraq as a country and the region as a whole was going through some testing times. Uh, the inhumane and barbaric acts of terrorism and persecution brought about by terrorist groups and organizations had a far reaching impact on the existence of the Christians and Yazidis um, in their ancestral homeland. Um, a land where civilization was first born. Like it's something sometimes all of us were very proud of. Uh, when we talk about our heritage and our, and our ancestry, we're like, okay, they, they were these people who uh, built the first civilization, uh, the foundation, the setting stone for what we have now. And it, these are people who've been mentioned in Bible and religious books and history books. So it's very sad to see that this civilization, this civilization is actually coming to an end uh, because of such acts or because of um, going through hardships and not having a place where they can um, preserve their their identity. And um, because of that, we've been seeing that a lot of people are um, now uh, be facing immigration and they're trying to reach out to other countries and other places where uh, these young people um, want to find a safe heaven and they're going to the diaspora. And this phenomenon, it's still active and might re regrettably lead to the dis disappearance of the indigenous minorities in, in our country. And uh, um, as, as it's known that um, CUE students are, uh, most of them are IDPs and they're victims of ISIS. And they are still living in IDP camps. We actually have students who were uh, captived by ISIS. Uh, we have uh, a young lady, she was taken by ISIS in 2014 up until 2017. And this is something that um, it empowers us because we can see this young lady and what she became because she was a suicidal person and now she's one of the top students at the university. And same thing with the Christians who came from the Nineveh Plains, from Karakosh, uh, from Hamdania. Um, they've been displaced for so many times. They lived in like with 20 other families in a very small home. And to see those people actually graduating and getting a higher degree, um, it's something to look, to look up to, and it's very inspirational for all of us. And that's what keeps us going as a university. Um, and um, as a university, we also encourage students to implement the concept of thriving and not surviving. We need to break the stigma of being treated as victims of war, but uh, being persons of dignity and value. We do live in a war-torn country, that's reality. Um, and we have been through many hardships, uh, especially in the last 30 years, but we need to overcome that and with hardships comes strength. And that's what we see from our students and that's what we're seeing from the community as a whole. And um, as a university, we also, um, we're, we're based on Christian ethics and the transcendent teachings of Christ that call for charity, justice, mercy, um, humanity, loyalty, and commitment as well. And uh, we believe that in Christ, uh, we never give up and we will continue to use education as a powerful tool to face all our challenges and help preserve our mission um, and our history and our culture. And uh, most importantly, to look forward to securing our future. And that's why exactly um, the 150 scholarships would provide uh, these youth with an opportunity to um, have a better future, to uh, not just think about leaving the country and going to another place because they cannot survive here. We're providing them with an opportunity to study, to get the education that they need, to, um, uh, to have a work opportunity, to stay here, and uh, to actually live in, in, in equality and have a steady lifestyle. Um, the 150 scholarship is not going to be an opportunity for only 150 students. It will be an opportunity for 150 families that are um, 
lacking the opportunity to stay here. And um, as we can see from, um, from what's happening, even when families are uh, moving to other countries, their struggles and um, their uh, suffering might be even more because they're going to another community. They're trying to um, um, amend and uh, survive in a, in a community that's different to them. So that will take time. It will take also um, opportunities from their uh, children to, uh, to pursue their studies at a younger age. Um, and also, um, with the help of ACN, uh, we're hoping that we will give hope to these people. We would have, give hope to these uh, young adults to um, to actually uh, stay here and do their studies that most of them they were not able to do due to the war, due to displacement, um, due to a lot of things that they've been through in their life, due to the loss that they've been through. Um, we have students that uh, when they talk about their experience, it will be very difficult for most of us to even think about it and having them living it and then overcoming that and coming to the university, being very, um, strong to and straightforward we're here to study we're not here to uh just spend time it's university alive and that's it to get that certificate no we want to learn to get a certificate to benefit from it find a job and pursue our dream and to also provide for our families this is what what i hear from the students um despite all that um the environment that we have at the university where we have students from different backgrounds, different uh, religion. We're just um, preparing the students for what will come in the future because most of these um, students, if most of these uh, youth, they come from backgrounds where there are different people from different faiths, they're, they have conflicts with each other. But when they come to the university and they're, um, coexisting with other students. They're uh, studying in the same room uh, with Muslims and Yazidis, Christians, all together. Uh, they're, they're friends with each other. Uh, they spend time outside of university with each other. So we're preparing them that when you go, uh, after you graduate from the university, you go to the real world, it's not only one faith and you, it's also to uh, it's also important to respect the people who's coming from a different background. We should not judge them from w by what they believe in and what their faith is. We need to judge them as human beings, and that's what matters the most. I'm sorry for making it too long to you guys. I I keep talking and I can talk about this for so many hours, um, but. Um, if you have any questions or, or anything, I'll be very happy to respond and to answer um, as much as possible. Thank you, Vida. Thank you for this uh, lovely introduction. I will propose uh, to give us first uh, Katie the word. Maybe she had questions because uh, she was the one who wanted uh, really to get the meeting and ask the other people just to put uh, their hands if they want to speak or that to write uh, the question if they don't have a, a micro so that we have a, 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 a rhythmus after the first question from Kathy. It's okay for you, Kathy? Yeah, sure, yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Vida, it's lovely to meet you. And first of all, I just wanna congratulate you on what a fine young woman you are and how inspiring you are. Um, I have children who are your age and um, I would be very proud if you were my daughter, you're doing a, a wonderful job, so well done. Thank um, you very much. What I'd like to ask, um, because you've had a chance to study in the United States and now to come back to Herbal, what I'm very interested in the lesson we can bring to our young people in cultures like Australia, the United States. States. And I think um, what, from your perspective, what are the sort of lessons that you can teach our young people in countries where they haven't experienced some of the difficulties that your students have had. Um, um, I guess my question is, you know, what, what's the sort of message that you would bring if you were going to go back home or go back to the United States? What are the sort of messages? I mean, one of the things you just said was very inspiring where 
um, you teach, you know, your students to thrive, not just to survive. Um, can you just talk, talk about that a little bit about how you've, you know, you've been in both places and the lessons that you, you, you bring to us? I think that's my question. Thank you, Kathy, um, and thank you very much for your nice words. Um, actually, um, I've lived here my entire life. Uh, I've only I've only did my master's in the states, so for two years. And uh, when I went there, um, it was my aim was to also convey the culture and the message from a young um, Iraqi. Uh, girl that's going to another country to live alone and to also um, to a country where the, all they see about Iraq is from the news. Mm. They have not seen the real thing. And uh, one of the first questions that I've been asked when I went there was, um, do you use camels for transportation? Do you have TV? Uh, what do you do? What do you do? Um, it's just it, it conveyed it's um, it gave me the sense that people are still they still think that Iraq is we're in like in, in the very early centuries and we have not moved from there since then. Um, mm. It's important to convey the idea that no Iraq is a country. We have technology that you all have. Um, we have the, uh, the, the lifestyle that most of you have. It's just the, the, the opportunities that they have in life, it's not like what we have. We use the small opportunity, the little opportunities that we have uh, as young uh, people here, as the youth here, we use the small opportunities and we try to make something out of it. And I believe that comes um, from um, the sense that uh, we have not been given a lot. And the message, when, when people were asking me these questions, I'm like, well, in 20, 2014, where uh, ISIS was about, came to uh, Iraq and um, invaded some of the areas, uh, Erbil was actually the capital of tourism in the Middle East. So we have these things, they're just not being shown on TV. They're just not being uh, told to people. Um, and I believe that the media plays a big role here. So one of, the, one of the things that we should do as Iraqis as well is to raise awareness that um, you should not be afraid to come to the country. Um, I don't know how many of you know Joe, John Smith uh, from, uh, He's American, but he lives in Germany, I believe. He's been here for so many times. He can tell you all about the country, the, the history, the ancient heritage that it has. So by raising awareness, using social media, using um, success stories, using our own stories to tell to people. And I believe that will inspire the youth of other countries that um, with hardship comes strength. And it's not... Um, surviving, but it's actually, we need to thrive. It's not thriving, but surviving. That's great, Vita. And I think, I think one of the things that um, we, we really love to hear us are those stories and personal reflections. So in whatever way, as, as time goes by to sort of hear those stories um, from the students and um, the way, the way study has impacted their life and, and move from that place of surviving to thriving is, is wonderful. And it's been just wonderful hearing your story. I, I could listen to you for a lot longer. So um, thank you very much. I'll let other people ask questions, but it's lovely to meet you. And thank you for sharing. Thank you very much, Kathy. Yes, Marie, Marie Faye, yes. You have to turn on, yes. Hi, Vida. Um, Again, thank you very, very much for um, your words. It's really helpful um, to us and to understand what you've what you've been through and what you're doing. Um, I've got a particular question. I'm going to speak to 30 young adult Catholic leaders in this country in a, in a month's time. And they asked me to speak about how to share how to share the faith in, a, in a, an environment that isn't 
open to the faith. Now, obviously, our experience here and your experience there are polar, you know, are so far apart. But people here are finding, especially in universities, they are finding it really difficult to even admit to being Catholic um, because of just the, you know, the, the polite kind of, they're just looked down on and there's that whole culture coming in. And we feel that we can learn so much from, and as I say, not comparing our experiences to yours, but what I will hopefully be using a lot of what you've said in when I speak to them. Um, what would you say to them? They're kind of at that early stage of feeling slightly under pressure for being Christian. And then people that you you work with have experienced outright persecution. So if, if you were to say to them, how would you share the faith or how did you manage? What would you say to these 30 young Catholic leaders that I'm going to be speaking to? What, what would you say to them about sharing the faith, keeping the faith? And I love exactly what Cathy said, you know, this idea of not just surviving, because I think even here, as a, for some Catholics in some universities, they do feel it's a bit of survival, not in a physically attacked way, but ideologically they are surviving because they can't really show what they believe because of the stigma related to certain Catholic moral issues and all the rest of it. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, in, in my opinion, and according to my experience, uh, the Holy Spirit plays a big role in this. So if you believe in, um, in your own beliefs, if you believe that in, in Christianity and Catholicism, you'll be able to uh, preserve it as well. Um, one of the things that we go through, one of the difficulties that we go through here as a university is uh, holding the name Catholic. Uh, that's actually a big challenge that we're facing. And that's one of the reasons why no other university in the Middle East and North, North Africa holds the name Catholic. It's a Catholic university, but they hold the different names like Holy Spirit or other, other names. But for us, we, we wanted to face this challenge because we believe in our identity. Uh, we believe in our uh, in, in in the values and um, in um, the, the, the the Catholic values that we have, uh, but we still keep fighting. Uh, the Holy Spirit will uh, will do its job. And when I was in the states, I I exactly know what what you're saying and how these young uh, people are feeling, uh, because when I went to the states. Um, I, I'm a practitioner. I go to church. I go to um, I uh, go to Bible studies and all of these things. And I was going when I went there. Uh, University of San Diego is a Catholic university, but um, most of of my friends they were not Catholic and they were not even Christian. And uh, it got to a point where I was even. Um, not scared, but a little bit, as you said, uh, people would look down to me if I uh, do the sign of, of the, the cross. It would be, they were like, oh, are you Christian? I'm like, yes. You're from Iraq and you're Christian, you're Catholic. And I'm like, yes. Is, that a, is there any problem with that? So it was difficult, but um, if, you, if your beliefs are strong enough and you're not afraid to show them, that's where Holy Spirit will come in. Because it's not something that we need to sit and hold back and then we wait for something, to, a miracle to happen. No, we need to actually do it. And uh, that helped me a lot. And even here in the community, uh, when we go to, to the shops or something like that, like my friends used to say, uh, like when, for example, we're here, uh, uh, the bell of the, uh, of the church, we're used, to it, whenever we, we we hear that, it's like we uh, we do like in the, in the name of God and Holy Spirit and, and um, the God the Son and Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes when I'm when I'm when I do that or I wear my cross when I go around with like in, in a Muslim community, people are like, "No, hide it. It's not good for your security, or it's not good. People might attack you, or people might talk." Um, um, like th there's a lot of different things, but. Because I believe in who I am, and I believe that um, Jesus Christ is there to protect me, and me believing in Him is not going to give me any harm. I'll do it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, 
That's perfect. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Yes, now we have Patricia from the UK. Patricia. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really interesting response. And it kind of feeds into the question I had in my mind. I suppose two things is um, obviously the Catholic University is still relatively new. And therefore, how are you driving the culture of excellence of studies in order that it becomes a go to place people who are not Christian want to go to? And, and at the moment, how, it, how is the Catholic University viewed by people who are not Christian? So thank you very much, Patricia, for your question. Um, uh, it's Catholic University in Erbil is a new university. That's correct. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to bring on uh, the best in the field uh, in terms of ac academic uh, academia, like faculty, academic faculty, um, and also trying. We're trying to adopt uh, the best um, curriculums as well. Uh, now we're in the process of consulting with American university or universities and other universities that we're building partnership with in order to enhance and develop our own curriculum so that we're covering all the areas needed for this for uh, any student to graduate. Um, in terms of the culture and having non-Christian uh, students coming to the university, um, there is something here like we, we there are some universities who actually uh, do not care about student attendance, they're private universities, they do not care about student attendance or student um, uh, activities or uh, their performance. Um, it's a private university, you go pay, after four years you get your degree. You only, you, all you need to do is to, to go to the, your final exam, do your test, even if you do bad, in four years you'll get your degree. That's not how the case is at the Catholic University in Erbil. Attendance, we take it very seriously. When it comes to a specific number, this person needs to justify why they've been absent for these many times. And that will affect the overall grade as well. Um, this is one way that we're preserving um, the, uh, that we have good uh, attendance in terms of students. Uh, we're also um, trying to hold seminars, conferences at the university um, on different topics. That will bring more attention to the university because people still think that um, CUE is a place only where uh, biblical studies are being done. Uh, it's not a place where actually we have departments, different departments. It's like any other uh, private university here where we have like IT, accounting, computer science, and, and all of these departments. So as part of awareness and our marketing and advertising strategy, we're trying to hold other uh, different types of conferences, especially on um, uh, coexistence and diversity where people are coming from different backgrounds to the university to see the university to introduce them to, or, to its programs and uh, that way we're actually having uh, students reaching out and as a result of the very first outreach phase of the 150 scholarships um, we received uh, 1277 responses of interest uh, for the to come to the university and uh, from all over Iraq and most of them were Muslims uh, We have Christians as well, but like we are getting the um, the attention from people who are from different uh, backgrounds as well I don't know if that answered your question Patricia. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Just one supplementary then um, I suppose it could become eventually a bit like the um, University of San Diego uh, where it's it's a Catholic university, but more of a mixed, very much more mixed. Will you maintain the Catholic other faith balance? Will it always remain a, a core of Catholic students? Definitely, uh, we will keep that, uh, and we're actually thinking of uh, including uh, a course on Catholic teachings and history of the Church uh, in the in the East. Uh, into the curriculum. We're trying to do our best with the Ministry of Higher Education to include that, to get the approval from them, to include that in our curriculum. And that will be a core course for everybody that who needs to take. So our Catholic values and our Catholic identity will be preserved, definitely. 
Yes, now we have Ben Hart, ben Hart from the director from the Australian office. He has a question. Thanks, Vida. Thanks for your time. Very much appreciate it. We, um, we sent out to our benefactors the information about the CUE and, and some responded back to support the students, which is very good. Um, you never get all good responses and I wanted to share one and get your response even though I wrote back to him. I took into the mail we sent the wording around empowering women. I just picked up the quote. I thought, okay, we'll put it all in there. And of course, someone wrote back to me and he said, well, you know, why are you, what does this, because that has a certain connotation in the West, especially those who come from a, you know, a, a very family oriented perspective. Well, why aren't, why are you empowering women? What does that mean? Why aren't you encouraging them to have good marriages and families? And I wrote back briefly, I didn't want to get into debate, but anyway, I wanted to put that out. And because I know you mentioned the word empowering women in your intro and just understand from you for my benefit, what does that mean when you say that? And is that different to what the type of way that's used here? And I'd say it's used in a very, um, it puts you on one side of the fence or another as to how you think about women and education, the future and what everyone should be doing. Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, empowering, mo so I've been in both uh, uh, communities. Empowering women for a community is different how it's understood in other communities. For us, empowering women is very important because women are mostly looking down to when it comes to um, education. Now, many families here, uh, they're, they still think that um, boys, men can go to school while women, they need to be at home. So um but at, at the university we actually were very proud to say that more than 60 percent of our students are female so we're empowering their education we're empowering that they would have a career in their life women are not only to stay at home if it was like that i wouldn't have my parents wouldn't have let me to go to move to another country alone for two years to do my master's and then come back um and uh, I, would, I would not have been able to have this position and to, to work at the Catholic University in Erbil. So empowering women is very important, especially when it comes to marginalized people, where, uh, because some of these families, some of these communities, they still, they come from the villages and the ideas in the village are different than how they are in the city, especially here in, in our community. Village, as I mentioned, men go out, do work, study, get the education, get the degrees and everything, while women, they need to be at home, cook, clean, raise the children. Uh, but we need to break that. Um, women can get can have really high positions uh, in the community. They can, uh, and I don't think that's very much threatening for the men <laughs> in a way or another in a community where we actually need these forces, where we actually need um, these qualifications. Uh, in order to build a community, in order, in order to build a future for the people. So uh, each community understands this word, this term differently. And uh, for us, it's very, very much needed. Yeah, I understand. Yours is a very, I mean, that's a very Western response and that's exactly what he was uh, protesting against. I guess I'm interested then in what is the vision of marriage and family in Iraq today? Uh, we need good families as much as we need careerists as well. So how does that work out in, in a modern Iraq and a Christian Iraq? Well, it's going very well. <laughs> I'm engaged, so I think that's working for me. <laughs> um, that works. It, it's actually, uh, to be honest, uh, it's working very well for the families here. Uh, we have students who have families, who have children. And uh, this year we had one of our Yazidi students. She came in and she did her finals and she was nine months pregnant. So we have actually... Uh, people, especially women, they want to do to pursue their education. And at the same time, they're having family, they're having children, and they're doing good in both. So uh, that means that the women here are very much um, enthusiastic into pursuing their education. They're very much into, okay, I'm going to have my family. I'm fine with that. I love my family. I love raising my kids. But also, I need to do something for my education that will help me raise my family and my children better that will help me have a better family um 
So this is also becoming an idea here that education is actually a tool that I can use to have a better uh, children, better raised children, better family, uh, a more standard and um, quality uh, understanding with the other partner as well. Very good. Thanks, Peter, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Now we have a question from Grace. Uh, she wrote it in the chat, uh, Vida, because uh, she has not a good audio. She's thanking you for your wonderful presentation. And then she asked, could you please kindly share your daily work experience and what inspired your drive as a young person, yourself working at the center of this project, with this focus on young people as the hope and future of Christianity in Iraq? Thank you very much, Grace. Um, actually, um, I love working with youth. Uh, it just like brings this uh, child in you. Uh, working with adults, it's very much mature as well, but working with youth and help, helping them get to a place that where they need is very much, um, uh, it gives you a power to go forward, a power to do more. Like when I come to the university and I see all these students outside and like, it's just, it gives you more energy. Uh, there is energy in youth and, and they can send that to, to other people as well. So when you see them laughing, uh, speaking, having conversation, playing sports, um, just like um, group, grouping all together, talking about normal things in life. Um, it just throws a smile on, on my face every single morning until I come to my office. And then that gives me um, the, uh, the energy to do better, actually, to perform better. And whenever we have an activity where the students are involved and um, actually the students who are the ones um, uh, organizing the events that's something else like it's your they're just taking the responsibilities of organizing events doing things being leaders although it's a small event but that would show what leadership skills they have in order to implement them in the future in order to implement them in their normal life outside of university so um it's uh, these things all uh uh help us in order to do better as a university and it drives us to do better um, as individuals and as an and as an higher educational institution as well very good thank you Vida, in the name of grace as well uh, after wait uh, in the meantime uh, Waiting for other questions, I wanted to do as well a question. You spoke about um, that we have always uh, in Asia and be very, very aware of the danger of emigration from Christianity from the Middle East, not just in Iraq, as in Syria and now in Lebanon. You have been uh, in the States, so you. I wanted to have, to have two questions. One, did you have in one moment the feeling, oh, I want or I prefer to stay here? My life will be much more easier. Uh, and what, how was your decision to go back to, to Iraq? as a young uh, lady with all the future uh, before you. And the second question is, uh, what about the students? Um, do you have sometimes the, uh, how they, they're feeling? Because in ACN, when we started the program, I remember we had some benefactors also telling, okay, you will uh, in, engage you a lot for the students, for the future, and then they will left. So what about my, my support for Iraq? Maybe at the very end, it is not working. So these two questions. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, for the first one, um, and actually I had the opportunity to stay and work after I graduated and after I got my master's in the States. Uh, but it was difficult for me because I came with a, with a mission or with something in mind. It was difficult for me to um, leave everybody behind, leave my family, leave my future, which, uh, uh, that was the reason why I wanted to do my master's on peace and justice. It was something to, in, in order to get the education I need to do something for my, for my community. So I had these ideas, of course. And um, I had the opportunities as well. Um, in San Diego, there is a big community of Chaldean uh, people there in El Cajon. And I've been receiving so many um, 
offers come work here you can live here and then you can bring your family over as well you leave iraq you're not going to gain anything from there build your future here in america if, if i wanted or not like when i was there and hearing all these things i had a moment to think about it should i go back or should i stay here and bring my family over to have a life to start a new uh, experience in in the states then i was like um if i do that other people start doing that and it's not it's not going to be only me the whole community will leave christianity will no longer be there no i came here with a mission i take the education i go back try to help the, the young people to stay in the country to help the family stay in the country and in order it's uh, if we don't build the community nobody's going to do it if you don't do it ourselves nobody's going to come and and be like uh okay I'm, I'm i'm not chaldean i'm not uh my ancestors are not from here then but i want to uh, to be a chaldean and stay and and work here it's us we are the you can say the uh, um, the grandchildrens of the people who built the civilization. So we need to stay here. If we don't do it, it will be very difficult for others to do it as well. So uh, the, I, that idea came in and I was like, okay, I need to go back. When I came back here, it was difficult for me because I had a reverse culture shock um, after living in a community for two years and then coming back, it was a little bit difficult in the beginning. But then later on, it was easy for me to cope in because the archbishop was like, Hey, Vida, come, we need you at the Catholic University in Erbil. So I came in, I started working. When I saw the youth here, I was like, okay, that's why I came back. I need to help these people stay here, get the education and help them as much as I can and um, assist them to build their communities, to build their country, their, their, uh, their families, and uh, also to give them a sense of belonging. Uh, that that was actually why like that drive me to come come back here. It drove me. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Maria, your other, other question, Maria. It's about the feeling of the students today, even with the question of immigration. Okay. If they will be very well formed, maybe they decide to go out. Um, it will be difficult for them to think of going to uh, to the diaspora, to go to other countries. If they have a good job, if they have a good education, they will be here. They will stay here. I know a lot of families who travel to other countries and now they're actually thinking of coming back here because this is where they belong. This is where home is. So, uh, they just want to come back and it will be difficult if we provide these youth with this opportunity and we provide them with uh with opportunities to be able to work here then they would have an income they would be able to build a family um and we all know the hardships of living in another country and starting fresh thank you Vida. now we have a question from daniele Uh, Daniele, no, your audio is not. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Vida. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question who is related actually with your um, previous answer. Uh, is the University of Erbil working um, on contacts with uh, companies in Iraq uh, so that you can offer a job opportunity to your students inside the country? after their graduation. And then I have another question. Where do the professors uh, who teach uh, in the University of Erbil come from? Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, yes, actually, last year we held our very first, and we were the first uh, institution in the whole country to hold a virtual job fair. Uh, due to the pandemic, there were international job fairs held by big companies here, but when due to the pandemic and everything, we thought of a way to help our students and to help the community as well, to connect them with employers in order to uh, be able to find uh, job opportunities. So last year we held our very first virtual job fair 
and uh, we're 12 companies because it was the very first experience. A lot of companies, they were hesitant to participate. Um, 12 companies participated, um, including hotels, restaurants, like very high standard hotels as well. Uh, restaurants, uh, companies, IT companies, um, banks. Um, another university actually participated in our job fair. Um, and they had many vacancies where um, not only our students, but also people from the community, 24 people were able to find a job because of that job fair. And that's a big number for us as a first experience. And also you, we, pro, we were able to provide uh, 24 families with a job, with an income, with a job opportunity. And also part of our mission at the university, like for now at the moment, we have 16 of our uh, third and fourth year students are interning at the university in the different departments in uh, IT, uh, in computer science, um, like the I ICT department of the university, accounting, finance, and uh, marketing or international relations people are working in terms of like media and how to work around that. We have students are um, interning at other uh, companies at the moment. We value internship because that provides the students with an opportunity to actually practice what they have learned uh, at the university in the, real, in the real world. And it also gives an opportunity for the employer to get introduced to our students and the qualities that um, they have. Um, so we, we worked on that and um, actually our students are about to finish their internships. Most of them, they will finish either mid-August or end of August. Thank you. Sure. So uh, yeah, I, the second uh, question about the professor. Uh, right. Where oh, do yeah, they come sorry. from? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our professors, uh, we have local, and uh, we have uh, actually um, prof um, one professor coming from Australia. We have from India, especially in terms of accounting and computer um, science. Uh, we have uh, from the UK. And we're also uh, we, we're, we're, we're in the process of hiring more people. So uh, we're hoping that we can get uh, people from other countries as well. OK, thank you. Okay. I think Patricia, she has uh, another question. And then I will say that we have, after Patricia, the last question. So please <laughs> okay. feel free to, to think about it. Thank you. My, my question is to go, uh, follow on really from Daniela is, is um, really about the employment. Uh, obviously, it's early days and you're finding uh, employment for your students, but are you working towards an employment rate or employment target that you want to reach sort of 100% of all your students? Um, end up with a job and secondly um, as the jobs start to emerge are there is there any sense that um, your, your students are now capable of taking up senior positions but they're not being allowed in due to discrimination is there a sense in, in the society that um, the fact that you're Catholic or Christian will actually impact your ability to get a job thank you um... I'll, I'll answer the second one because I kind of got into it and then if you get, oh yeah, it was employment, I believe, uh, the percentage of employment. Um, at the moment, we have a small number of graduates. So uh, this year we had 30, last year was the first batch of graduates, we had eight. So the, the current number that we have, we're trying to provide them with an opportunity as much as we can. So we don't have a set percentage for now, but we're trying to find all of them the opportunities and um, we're trying uh, to connect them with employers, writing them support letters, uh, provide them with all the documents that they need in terms of transcript and, and like all of their, um, the, like for example, curriculum information, what they have studies. We have try we're trying to provide them with all these that will help them. Um, as I mentioned, since it's early stage now, we don't have a set percentage, but we're, we're helping everybody. And um, I'm sorry, I'm having a very short memory these days. <laughs> um, what was the, the other one? It was, it was just about the, um, you know, obviously they are skilled people now, able to take up senior positions. 
And is there a sense that discrimination might stop them getting these posts? Yeah. Um, so as um, fresh graduates, uh, we don't try to put them at senior positions right away. It's a step by step process. So they need to learn. They, they gain the, the, the education. They need to learn the, um, uh, the basic technical um, aspects when it comes to the work uh, life. So it's uh, step by step, not right away senior, but we try to give them in the very first, like we have, we also employ our graduates at the university. Uh, so we start with them fresh, step by step, until they get to a position where they can have um, senior uh, positions as well. But it's just that, um, and um, I, I don't think it would be very healthy for them after graduation right away, we put them in a senior position or they hired in a senior position. Um, because we know in the real world, it would be very difficult to have a, a young person who's just a fresh graduate, only 22 years old to have a very high position. Culturally, it should go step by step. And that's how the real world is, unfortunately. And um, for discrimination, um, we have not come across that so far. Um, all of our students who have applied, um, they have not complained from discrimination. And that's not the sense in general as well here. When people apply for a position, uh, the employer, especially the big companies, they look at the experience of the person, the CV and not the ethnicity. Uh, or the, the religious ba religious background of the person. So we have not come across that uh, up until now, thankfully. Very good. I don't know if it's somebody who like, uh, somebody missed something that, uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, we have settled not as of more time, so that's um, because I was wondering if, uh, but maybe in the future, uh, Vida, uh, will be also great to get uh, some testimonies of the students. You know, you have told us about this uh, girl uh, that she was three years uh, kidnapped, you know, that maybe you have other people who, so to, to try to see also how much healing as well is bringing the university, yes, uh, because I think trauma healing is probably as well one thing that you have to to work on. But as the time is uh, finished, I don't want uh, to start at a new topic, but I wanted to tell you, because I think it's also important, and I missed to tell that at the very beginning, Vida, these people that you are seeing here, you know, Reinhardt, you know, Regina, you know, John Smith, you know, even Eugenia, who is working here as well in our department, but the people today that you meet, they are the ACN uh, staff who is really going to the to the hard field. And they are really working very hard always to, to find uh, the, the tools in the middle to support our project. So for me, it's uh, today, uh, so I think it's a very special moment to, to we're always a bridge and now we're on the, we have here the two. Okay, the benefactors are missing this with the, ben, at the very end of the bridge will be the benefactor who is helping you. But this is a very important part of this bridge, uh, all of you uh, who are here. And this is why I think it's very good for me that this possibility is uh, done sometimes uh, to, it's not always possible, but that you know that they are the ones who are later uh, speaking in the name of uh, university to ask uh, for, for middle, for fundraising to the, um, to the benefactors. And the second thing I, I was thinking, uh, we have uh, 6th of August this week, uh, this will be on uh, Thursday, no, on Friday, né? and the 6th of August is, uh, I think, for everybody in ACN, uh, like a, a data more important and uh, one of the most, uh, yeah, I think significant dates, no, 2014, 6th of August, I think everybody who's working here knows that was a, a, a date of uh, suffering for all of you. So uh, seven years after this, uh, as all, I always think it's a miracle, and, uh, probably nobody will think about uh, that now we are uh, working on the future and trying to have a very big dream uh, for the next time in Iraq and uh, really letting behind these uh, huge shadows of uh, of the yeah of pain and uh, and death who, who you have him so I think this is a, a big uh, a good moment this week uh, to have uh, not just uh, to think about the bad times but not to think about the future good times were coming and also to have the opportunity uh, to exchange with you from our national offices that I always we are always very grateful for the huge job that they are doing. Um, Sometimes we don't see that, uh, but we know 
very much uh, so this is what i wanted to thank you for your time and i think it was uh, very good um and yeah, and i want... thank you very much all of you especially um it's you who are uh, keeping uh, keep uh, keeping us going at the university as well and you're the one who's giving providing these students with the hope for for a better future so i thank every and single one of you for your affair, offer uh, efforts and for um everything that you do we are here because of you and the university has been very much thankful for ACN for all of its efforts and all of its assistance that has, has been giving not only for the university but the archdiocese as a whole over the years. So um, we are very, very, very much honored that uh, we're partnering with you and um, we're, we're very much pleased and words cannot be enough to describe how happy we are with this other opportunity and uh, i don't know if you've seen it or not but we have your logo at the university we have a whole wing and it's been gifted by icn and i can share photos if you want and uh, we have you in our hearts we have you at the university and we're very much thankful thank you yeah, and we're united in prayers as well i wanted to tell you Definitely. It's always very important. So yeah. thank you to everybody as well from Australia to Europe. As I told you, the, the other part of the, the continent is today not present. But um, thank you also, Katie, again for your idea. And uh, please feel uh, always free if you think that's a very important for Asia, very important project for Asia and is coming up uh, and you want to, to have these kind of meetings, we will always try to, to organize. Thank you, Vida, because I know you were very busy, so it took a time to, to find the, the, the time and uh, also we will pray for you and for all your efforts, not just uh, as I tell you, as you know, uh, ACN is always providing support, but also providing this other support, which I, we believe that is very important is to be united in prayers. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vida. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Vida. Bye-bye. All the bye -bye. best. Bye. Thank you.